Uh, hello and welcome to uh, the second Inspire seminar this spring. Uh, the Inspire seminar series, um, with the Inspire seminar series, we wish to focus on the role of art, artists and activism in times of violent conflict and war. And it's a monthly online space, which uh, we also hope will go hybrid now as the spring, spring is approaching, where we invite researchers and artists to explore art-based methods, collaborative methods, ethics of doing research with artists, art as transformation, engaged scholarship, uh, all in the context of violent conflict and war. And the seminar series is part of the INSPIRE project that we are currently working on here at PRIO. And today we are very happy to have uh, Lois Klassen with us. Welcome. Uh, Lois is an artist, writer and researcher based on Coast Salish ter territory, traditional and unceded, in what is referred to as Vancouver. Uh, she is known for long range projects that invite and engage participants in collective actions. Uh, her projects deliberately face ethical demand by way of social, aesthetic and material methods. Her project Reading the Migration Library invites collaborations in small press publishing of content related to current and historic approaches to migration. Um, Klassen was a Fulbright, Lois was a Fulbright, uh, 2020 Fulbright Fellow at the University of Tex Texas in El Paso, Center for Inter-American Border Studies and the Rubin Center for Visual Arts. And uh, she is an SSHRC postdoctoral fellow in the Critical Media Arts Studios at Simon Fraser University. Uh, Lois also serves as the coordinator of the Emily Carr University Research Ethics Board and is a member of the Canadian Association of Research Ethic, Ethics Board's Circle of Experts. And today um, Lois will talk about research and creation in sites of ethical demand, models of conduct and practice. We're very happy to have you here with us Lois. Thank you so much for that introduction, Sarah. It's really a privilege for me to be addressing you. Um, how's the audio? Is it OK? OK, awesome. Um, the questions that are asked um, by Inspire, by the Inspire Project are questions that hold my attention and the attention of those who, I'm who I have collaborated with as we all struggle with ethics and art. So I expect that we can have a very useful discussion today. And it's really early in the morning here at six, six in the morning. Um, so I'm going to need to stick to my script for co coherence. I hope to cover a lot of ground, um, but there will be hopefully at least half an hour for discussion later. So um, um, please be prepared to participate. Um, and also, I'm very willing to share these slides with you. I'm glad that there's a recording. Um, but if you're interested in the slides, there's links. You'll see them embedded in the slides that you might be that might be useful to you later. My first aim for this talk is to introduce a few procedural ethics approaches and tools for artists and others involved in arts based or creative methods and research with people involved in violent conflict or whose legal status is compromised or contested. My second aim is to situate my reflections in a Canadian context. The reason for this is, the reasons are um, the terminology research creation that you see on the slide there has been officially used with the Government of Canada in research and arts funding to encompass research-based art projects and arts-based research projects. The confusion and subsequent discourse that's ensued among practitioners has been surprisingly productive. The ethical considerations in the interdisciplinary approach that is this research creation have resulted in the production of critical discourse as well as practical guidelines. My talk follows this lively methodological debate. Also current, um, the country of Canada, the province of British Columbia, where I'm located, um, are experiencing a decolonial reckoning, as are many places around the globe, and I'm sure that's not, a, that's not news to you. 
decolonization of research and cultural production affects every aspect of my work. Active demands and efforts for decolonization in Canada impact the world as well, and vice versa. For instance, a third of the world's mining is regulated through Canadian laws. The practices of Canadian mining companies in Central America have a direct impact on the flow of asylum seekers at the northern Mexico border. Both the Government of Canada and the province of BC have recognized the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, or UNDRIP. Canada ratified it um, last year, no, 2020, uh, after decades of lobbying um, by Indigenous First Nations. BC uh, passed it in 2019. And I'll be briefly describe how UNDRIP affects ethics of research and cultural production. This image um, aims to reinforce this point. I took this photo on a glorious day in February on my travel back from um, back to British Columbia from Winnipeg, where I was visiting my parents. It was my first trip since the start of the pandemic. This breathtaking view of the Rocky Mountain Range was seen just inside the BC border from Alberta. I'm showing it to you because it might appear to be glorious in its emptiness of people or industry. There are no people seen, which is not surprising given the, given the temperature, it was probably around minus 20 Celsius, maybe colder. And because of the limited road access to these locations, owing to, again, heavy snow and avalanche danger. The snow is likely hiding the forestry, which might be visible in the summer. If the view stirs in you a wistfulness for an empty landscape to enjoy all to yourself on a long awaited holiday, I feel compelled to challenge this romanticism. Aware of UNDRIP and the Indigenous cultural and territorial resurgence in Canada, I need to point out that this is not an empty land. It has not been since what Indigenous people often describe as from time immemorial. So this slide is a screen capture of the interactive map nativeland.ca. In Canada, it's often circulated at the start of meetings like this one online, as presenters offer territorial acknowledgements and positionality statements. This website allows users to explore and learn about the often layered claims to territory in the locations of their work and property. The screen grab here shows Western Canada between what is commonly known as Manitoba, where you see the two lakes on the right hand side, um, and BC that's on the coast. So the photo of the mountains is located somewhere in the middle of this map, this image. Um, most places in this vast stretch of land have mul multiple and overlapping claims to the territory, which are visible um, when you actually use the map's interactivity. It's, it's a dynamic map that includes ways to contact tribal groups or their governance structures, some of which are sanctioned by the Government of Canada and some are held as hereditary or traditional with cultural and spiritual importance. So let me now offer the territorial acknowledgement from my host institution on a personal positionality statement. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at Simon Fraser University that university acknowledges that we live and work on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people of the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh nations. Today I'm in East Vancouver in the territory of the Coast Salish and Hunkamanam speaking nations, not so far from Cessnaton, the Musqueam city before the city, which once sat on the north shore of what's now known as the Fraser River at the point where it reaches the Salish Sea, or what's known as the Pacific Coast. Since contact, the burial grounds and storage areas of Cessnaton were the site of extensive looting in the name of anthropology and ethnography, so much, of, so, much so that the relations between UBC and Musqueam who successfully gained title to significant portions of UBC property were severed for many years. 
A formal agreement now sets ethical and legal standards for respectful and reciprocal research relationships between UBC researchers and their host First Nation. I'm of white settler descent born on Treaty 2 territory in Manitoba. Treaty 2 took effect in 1872 in advance of a large migration of agricultural settlers, including my grandparents, who migrated there from the southern Ukraine in the 1920s. As a Treaty Canadian, I work to respect Indigenous law and culture, which sometimes demands that I look critically at the colonial laws and institutions that govern the citizenship in Canada. In October, I was in a workshop with Carolyn Lynette, a researcher of participatory methods and social justice in forced migration. At her talk, instead of instructing us to simply acknowledge Indigenous territory where we were all located, Lynette asked us to list in the chat a publication in which we had described our positionality with respect to Indigenous territory. It was a good challenge for researchers. I was able to list a recent article that I wrote for this theme issue of Public Journal. I mention it because this issue, edited by Leah Dector and Carla Taunton, both of settler heritage, offers a multitude of art and research perspectives on uh, decolonization from non-Indigenous as well as Indigenous artists and scholars in dialogue. Scholars of settler descent, along with other Canadians, are struggling with methods of decolonization that do not end up recentering their already dominant settler position. This publication offers examples of much needed alternatives. So, continuing on the topic of territory and land, I want to share a few more views of my neighbourhood. I'm mostly house and neighbourhood bound these days due to a serious illness that I had to deal with this winter. So here's a photo from a recent walk that I took. When I walk, I often stop at the little free libraries that my neighbours have installed along the sidewalks in front of their houses. I often bring along copies of the publications that I made with artists and writers in my project reading the Migration Library. I deposit them in the libraries as one of RML's free distribution methods. This photo shows a poetry chapbook that I dropped off. It's by Graham McGarva, a retired Vancouver architect who immigrated here from the UK in the 1970s. Now an emerging poet, McGarva wrote this poem, a long story this, as a reflection on how the current city of Vancouver, to which he professionally contributed, has ended up being less hospitable for a newer wave of immigrants. This image, this is an image of the publications that were produced through community workshops in the RML projects from 2016 to about 2019. Each of these publications are roughly the size of a quarter letter sized sheet. They're easily produced and reproduced. They're freely available on the project website as files for download or for printing. And the next slide is an image of the publications that were published in a special series with commissioned artists and writers in 2021. With funding, we were able to produce editions of color publications with eight artists and writers from Vancouver, Mexico, Texas, New Mexico, and Ghana. They're also freely available by download or by mail exchange, mail art exchange, or in free libraries on the street. Um, on my walk at the free library on Ross Street, I traded McGarva's chapbook for the DVD Hotel Rwanda with McNulty playing the Canadian UN General Romeo Dallaire. I hadn't seen it, so that was convenient. Also on the walk, I came across another story of war, this one on a plaque that was prepared for a public storytelling project for the millennium in 2000. I was surprised that it was still uh, more or less legible. On it, I read the story told in a first person voice of Diane Meacham. I read that Meachin was immobilized in a body cast in 1939 when her family, when her father joined the military. She describes how her father's military employment was the cause of the family's poverty and resulted in the family's need to find cheaper housing during the Second World War. 
Nietzsche recounts how the generosity of people who built her a cart for outdoor mobility, store owners who gave her treats and food, volunteer educators who came to her home, and finally the doctor who waived his medical fees. Her line, what a lucky family we were, is repeated as a sidebar a little further down on the clock. Nietzsche's cheerful account of war and misfortune now sits on a street pole out of place and out of time. I notice that it's located four to five kilometers from the locations it describes, so I'm left wondering what, into, what went into the decision about its placement. Maybe the current residents of her of the places her family lived wouldn't want the story of poverty to label their um, addresses. Perhaps its pla placement is meant to unify all of East Vancouver as a zone of the city with a history of impoverishment, service workers and volunteers, people capable of turning a tough situation into a time of good fortune and luck. On my walk, I reflected on how the plaque now it was now also sitting outside of time, thinking of displaced Ukrainian families separated by mandatory military service. The cheerful tone signaled for me the retrospective denial that characterized a post-war generation in Canada. Shireen Razak has written about this kind of comforting mythology that Canadians hold dear. Razak writes, Believing ourselves to be citizens of a compassionate middle power who is largely uninvolved in the brutalities of the world, we have relied on these images and stories to confirm our humanitarian character. In 2000, the city of Vancouver was still producing a passive humanitarian image of Canada by way of its storytelling citizens in this portrait V2K project. After photographing the plaque, I get my groceries and I head home. At the end of the day, I watch Hotel Rwanda with my husband. Through some online surfing, we are reminded of its controversies. And coincidentally, I stumble across another article that Shireen Razak has written about the mainstream cultural production surrounding Romeo Dallaire's role in the Rwandan conflict, including this movie. I remember how in another text, uh, Razak had produced a stunning analysis of why two men were not held fully accountable for the 1995 murder of P Pamela George, an Indigenous woman in, in Regina, Saskatchewan. Razak's analysis lands hard on how the men's identity as white university students and athletes was actually dependent on violence towards Indigenous women in Canada. In the text about uh, Rwanda, entitled Stealing the Pain of Others, Razak again works out how Canadians and others benefiting from middle country citizenship are well suited to cultural productions like Hotel Rwanda, which situate the viewer as witness to atrocities defined and explained through white intercessors. The heroism that Canadians attribute to Dallaire is as a result of his presence as a witness at the scene of the conflict and his subsequent honesty about the way the failed UN mission resulted in his own battle with post-traumatic stress disorder. Razak questions this passive and indirect empathy on the part of Canadian viewers. Productions like Hotel Rwanda serve to differentiate those who suffer from those watching. Calling on Susan Sontag's regarding the pain of others, Razak writes that our sympathy proclaims our innocence as well as our impotence. Razak takes the critique of empathy and sympathy further by outlining how the theft of pain inevitably supports the racial logic of white privilege. In doctoral field work in New Mexico, I interviewed artists who were working in the sites of migration failures on traumas. I used the term ethical demand to reflect the reasons and methods that compelled them to work in these situations where ethics were continually questioned in themselves and by others. The term ethical demand responds to Simon Critchley's writings about artists and their responses to migration and other crises. 
Critchley writes that interesting art is always ethical because it's organized around an ethical demand. For Critchley, aesthetic forms are produced through sub sublimation, a psychoanalytic process of, re of reaching towards satisfaction or completion during the confrontation with the real. The ethical demand posed by the real, such as the Rwandan genocide or the murder of Indigenous women in Canada, is taken up in aesthetic objects as a process of resolving them psychologically and culturally, and Razak would argue politically. In my research, I argued that the execution of an artwork is thus inseparable from its socially situated emergence, a situation that's inc increasingly inflected by ethical judgment from critics and institutions, as well as the participants in the, in the artwork's process of meaning making. Along with ways of working and representing people caught in asylum claims and migration failures, I learned that artists and researchers needed to consider the ethical issues surrounding political recognition and visibility. Notions of nationhood, belonging, citizenship could be understood to be part of the project's creative production, whether or not this was the intention of the artist. <clears throat> Nicholas, uh, Nicholas Smirsov makes the distinction between visualization, which he describes as a, as a process of authority and the right to look, a uh, phrase borrowed from Jacques Derrida, as a process of autonomy. He describes how the right to look, quote, um, means requiring the recognition of the other in order to have a place from which to claim rights and to determine what is right. It's the claim to a subjectivity that has the autonomy to arrange the relations of the visible and the sayable. That's the end of the quote. The right to look is more than cultural recognition. It's the materialization of the political agency expected when those with legal and social stability encounter one another through the law and through other cultural forms and on the street. It's when we see each other and we recognize that we both deserve to be there um, and have the right to be there. In contrast, visualization is the term Mirzov uses to describe the process whereby citizenship is expected and evidenced through state processes of documentation, fingerprints, iris scans, and a myriad of other identifiers that are expected to be readily available for inspection and to travel through enforcement systems that reproduce a border zone um, to be identifiable, oh, pardon me, um, border zone wherever such identifiers are demanded. Although laws expect both citizens and non-citizens to be identifiable, citizens generally know when they will need to pr produce proof of identity, but non-citizens are in contrast expected to encounter unexpected demands for proof at any time. Researchers and artists who produce creative representation of undocumented people need to consider the implications of inadvertently increasing this discriminatory nature of the visualization. It's perpetrated not just by immigration enforcement, but also by the general public when we expect to know how an immigrant should look and behave. When immigrant stories are circulated as unique and particular, their opportunity to access legal and cultural citizenship may be further hindered. Schreiber describes how activist and artistic representation risks reproducing exclusions through these liberal tropes of visibility. That's her terms. To avoid contributing to discriminatory visual tropes, uh, Schreiber looks to migrant-led activist projects to understand ways out of this ethical problem with representation and visibility. She notes how migrant groups themselves have come to avoid perpetuating uh, migrant stories. The activist groups that she presents strategically focus their representation on how policies are affecting migrants. Artists working in collaboration with these groups tend to focus on representing border enforcement and how it's experienced rather than on the personal histories of individuals with traumatic stories. Their use uh, or participation in photography and other forms of representation can be considered uh, 
form of civic engagement, whether they're declared citizens or not. And I'm referring here to Ariel Azoulay's characterization of citizenship and non-citizenship as both governed and precarious to different degrees. Azuli notes that the way non-citizens may use methods like photography to make visible conditions of citizenship on their own terms. I argue that artists and researchers who are working with people whose legal status is compromised could be seen to be offering opportunities to make visible mechanisms of governance over the lives of non-citizens or those whose status is compromised. In other words, they're demanding the right to be seen and the right to look on their own terms rather than uh, being produced as subjects of state visualization. So one example of this method is the poem La Yalera Monologue by artist and poet Israel Harold Lopez from Santa Fe in New Mexico. Lopez served as a volunteer translator for families seeking asylum in Texas. In this poem and in the performance of, at the launch of the publication where it appeared, um, Lopez quotes the experience of a migrant caught in detention at the U.S. border. The text is a verbatim testimony that he later recalled and retold. In it, we hear little about the migrant's personal story or the reason for migrating. Instead, we hear about how border enforcement or governance over the non-citizen, in Azule's terms, is experienced by women and um, children in Texas. And I'll just read the final paragraph. When I finally talked to the man on the phone, the one who asks why we are here, well, that man told me he didn't care about the problems of my country, that they were not his problems and that I needed to sign the papers. Because if I didn't sign, because if I signed or didn't sign, they were still going to deport me. But I would say if they're going to deport me either way, then why would I sign the paper? And when he asked if I was afraid, I told him, yes, I told I, I was going to tell him all the things that were happening in El Salvador, but he didn't let me. And the lawyer here, well, he showed me where he lied. He said, I told him that I was coming to the United States to work, that I came for a better future for my children. I never said those things. I told him I was afraid that I was very afraid that I could not return to my country. I can't return. Okay, and then the next example I wanted to show you is Gabriela Galinda's um, production in Reading Migration Library. And this is Nota sobre un rec recorrido al centro de procesamiento de El Paso. Notes on a tour, the El Paso Processing Center. This artist book is comprised of the notes that Galinda's took while on a sanctioned tour of the Immigration Detention Center in her city of residence. A former resident of Ciudad Juarez, just over the Mexican border, Galindez was enrolled as a graduate student of Latin American and Border Studies at UTEP. Um, the tour, a rare opportunity, was made available to those graduate students, human rights workers and journalists who could pass the vetting process of Immigration Customs Enforcement, or ICE. While Galindas was also working directly with detainees and hearing their stories in the capacity of a human rights observer, she chose in this artwork not to record their voices, but instead to reflect on the way ICE portrayed itself to the local critics and observers. So I'm just going to read um, one section of the book. Our tour guide explained that in this law library, so they offer a law library to the, inside the um, uh, inside the detention center. Uh, there were women using the library. Oh, pardon me. Let me start again. Our tour guide explained that in this law library, the women are allowed to to work on their asylum case. There were women using the library when we visited, I noticed that there were very few or no books related to immigration law. One of the books I saw, uh, most of the books I saw were novels and a few old magazines. They had a few computers, which were all in use. The ICE agent said that the women had access to the internet. Someone asked if they had access to social media or email, and this was his answer. No, those platforms are not necessary for their asylum claim. 
In order for people to qualify for asylum, they must prove that they are either victim of past persecution or they have a, a well-founded fear of, of future persecution. This is very difficult to prove without contact from the outside world. Social media and or email would be the only way they would they would be able to gather proof. In the final and third example, I, I also use this approach of right to look over uh, reproduction of state visualization in my contribution to Beyond Settling, the journal that I mentioned at the outset. In this article, I chose to focus on the way I experienced the university during a resurgence of Indigenous sovereignty in the years I was involved in doctoral studies. My time at Queen's coincided with events such as Canada's bicentennial and the publication of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action. My text is structured as a letter to one of the university's prominent donors and the namesake of its professional gallery and prestigious art collection. Agnes Etherington, a sort of early 20th century art patron. In the context of your own work with artists or as artists or as researchers relying on the participation of others in your work, I expect that you've reflected on your positionality and reasons for facing the ethical demand in your own work. Eventually, we all need to develop ethical frames and codes. Unfortunately, these, are us these usually come after we've learned we've encountered difficulty or have seen the ethical problems in the work of others. Um, so, so far I've described um, an ethical model that was demonstrated to me by the artists that I worked with, along with the critical text that I mentioned. I subsequently made practice-based decisions to focus on and circulate the way non-citizens experience governance rather than their first person testimonies. But this is only one model or one model of ethical theory in arts based research. Another is found in Eve Tuck's letter of advice to Indigenous communities who are simulta simultaneously over researched and underrepresented. Tuck writes about how the era of damage centered research should be over for Indigenous communities and how adopting a framework of desire will better reflect the area of sovereignty that they're currently entering with UNDRIP. Tuck recommends establish tribal and community research ethics guidelines and create mutually beneficial roles for academic researchers in community research. In other words, Tuck is urging those who need the research to take charge of the ethics in research. And I should also mention that there are models for um, uh, Indigenous um, Communities First Nations to actually hold the research funding now. Another manifestation of both the sovereignties um, enabled through UNDRIP um, and legislation exists in this organization called First Nations Information Governance Centre, where they advocate for the sovereignty of First Nations data. And I just want to draw your attention to their moniker there, OCAP which uh, stands for Ownership, Control, Access and Possession of Research and Data within their jurisdictions. And since so many, uh, so much of Canada is, um, so is still um, the territorial um, status of it is in dispute, OCAP and First Nation, the principles of OCAP have long re reaching impacts for researchers. I have a few more resources and models for ethical conduct to share. This text, Think Before You Appropriate, was one of the first guidelines that we had to share with artists, with student artists and designers. It was produced with a um, collaborative research project with researchers at SFU and First Nations, not just in Canada, around the world. And these principles are still very useful and reflect some of the core principles of UNDRIP, like free prior and free prior and informed consent as well as benefiting sharing agreements and these i acknowledge that these standards um, for research ethics require time resources and strong relationships that are built over time um, and we're starting to notice how they're becoming the highest highest practice standards 
and they're becoming a model that are demanded by other groups and communities. And in the next slide, this is one uh, example of that. So the downtown east side of Vancouver, for instance, um, residents and advocates, particularly the Vancouver network of drug users, are resisting the excessive demands of researchers, artists and filmmakers in their neighbourhood. A coalition of organisers and activist researchers have produced specific standards for ethical research in that neighbourhood. This manifesto includes item two, a demand for community-based research ethics review, which is very simple, very similar to the advice that you've talked. And then another one is RISE in the next slide, um, and that's from the first ex-detainee refugee and asylum seeking seeker group in Australia. They've also published a list of ethical standards for in this time creative work and artworks with asylum seekers uh, authored by Tanya Kanas. Reflecting the popularity of participatory or social practice art methods during the past decades, the manifesto demands um, years of the manifesto's demands echo those years of misrepresentation and instrumentalization. And the final point seems to be directed to scholarly artists or practitioners of research creation who have employed creative methods agnostically to answer research questions. Kanas reminds them art is not neutral. And the final slide here offers a final resource from Canada. This toolbox is an educational research that summarizes some of the conduct issues that have been documented in locations where art design and scholarship have been intertwined in this term research creation. The case studies describe difficulties with articulating authorship, managing copyright, managing the financial interests when the creative art outcomes are situated inside an academic context. Um, and uh, likely you've had an opportunity to hear about um, Katerina, um, pardon me, uh, Cassie Grabska and Christina clark Kazak's book, Documenting Displacement Questions, Questioning Methodological Boundaries and Forced Migration Research, uh, that just came out. And I just wanted to highlight it as well because it's full of um, ex further sort of practice-based examples where the practitioners, the, the researchers reflect back on the ethical uh, dilemmas that they encountered and their um, ideas for resolving them. Um, all of these resources indicate to me that ethical approaches require awareness of not just the particularities of the location, but also the way other communities and um, groups have demanded standards of contact. If your research ethics boards are not aware of these resources, scholars can provide them or ask them to include community members or community ethics reviews into the university-based review. Finally, if you're a methodological innovator, I urge you to consider, if you haven't already, serving on research ethics boards in your community or university. Thank you so much for your attention and I'm looking forward to our discussion. Oh, Sarah, I think you're muted still. There. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lois, for a very uh, uh, insightful and very interesting uh, presentation with a lot of, I think, food for thought and also um, uh, points that would be really interesting to discuss further. And uh, many of the things you mentioned are also, um, you know, they. It, I see a lot of kind of um, themes that also have been very present in the research we're doing with Inspire. Um, I see we're not that many people, so I would actually suggest that uh, everyone who's listening in today can be upgraded so they can also kind of, we can see them and they can be, they can join the discussion. Uh, but while we wait for that, um, you can also type your questions or comments or anything you want to say in the chat, or you can, there's this little function at the top a raise, raise hand function, so you can raise a yellow hand uh, and then you'll be able to uh, quite, now you're all able to unmute yourself and you can also turn on your cameras, it would be really nice to see you all.
<laughs> Kasia, do you, did you have a something to say? Do you have a question? <laughs> do I have a question? <clears throat> or I saw I just saw your hand. Maybe oh, it was yeah. a. I was uh, saying hello to people, but uh, <laughs> <clears throat> sorry, I'm losing my voice. Um, now, Louise, you gave us a lot of uh, a lot of things to consider. I think this question of, and I'm also thinking about what you talked about um, in the context of the the book that Christina and and I have been working on. Um, and some of these chapters in the book also talk uh, about these different ethical uh, slash research dilemmas in the context of uh, creative uh, work. So we're, when we work across uh, uh, arts based methods or with um, with artists. Um, and I think for me, the question sometimes working with artists, especially in the Inspire project now, also becomes in terms of different types of protocols and different types of ethical approaches that we have in these different disciplines. Because, for example, in anthropology, we have such strong ethical codes that come from the medical anthropology. In sociology, we have another set of uh, ethical codes. Uh, and then uh, and then in arts uh, education, I assume you have uh, yet another code of, uh, of ethical uh, dilemma. So how do we combine them? How do we? Of course, I, I like this call for in one of your slides. There was this mentioning uh, whose uh, uh, ethical review, whose ethics is it? And I think for me, that's a key question when we work collaboratively across different disciplines and especially in this uh, sort of creative projects with uh, with art uh, as researchers with artists. <clears throat> so that's my question, but maybe some other people have other comments that are related to it. Um, maybe I'll just kind of pitch in a little bit here. I think that's where the community based research ethics um, model. Um, there's a lot to be learned from it, and I know that um, your text was mostly dealing with, you know, people in transition, people with very little stability, um, community alliances are maybe not so strong um, or, you know, a huge variety of all of the above. Um, so moving targets, um, if you think about, um, you know, where First Nations are in Canada as far as their research ethics are going, you know, maybe on the surface doesn't look like there's many things in common, but I'd argue that there's lots to be learned there. Um, and that's because of state vulnerability. Uh, they That's something that's shared, right? Um, uh, in terms of First Nations, you know, uh, some Indigenous people belong to a First Nation, but many are very similar to um, people in a state of displacement, and that's been documented. Um, anyway, uh, if you look at those models, you know, what are the what are the core ethical positions or what are the core positions that um, are reflected in, you know, ethical um, solutions, and that is um, understanding the power imbalance, um, number one, and then trying to find ways to mitigate that. Um, and understanding that if you don't mitigate that, then there's going to be ethical problems all the way through, you know, so it just puts that number one. And that, if you think about it from that perspective, then you have to deal with things like copyright, you have to deal with things like property, um, in Canada, you know, any creative work that someone has done is their property, um, whether or not it says copyright at the bottom or not, copyright is inherent. Um, it's a little bit different in the US, um, but still the principle should be the same. We should respect people's creative efforts. Um, and they, if they're professional, and I noticed that in the book that a number of researchers had found professional artists to work with. Well, if they're professional and there's funding for the research in Canada, those professionals need to be paid. And if they're not paid, um, you know, there has to be some really good explanation for that or agreement or something reciprocal. Otherwise, that's fundamentally um, in contravention of the 
um, funding agreements. Those kinds of things, you know, it just flips it. And then all of those other ethical codes should follow. And to achieve that, um, I think what a community-based research ethics board would uh, say is you achieve that by ensuring there is a community-based research ethics process. Um, the university-based process should defer to that process eventually, um, rather than the other way around. I, I've sat in rooms where um, First Nations council members have looked out to the C of UBC researchers and said, we're doing the ethics board review. You can do your own if you want, but ours is first. <laughs> Thank you. Um... It was also really interesting to see the, um, like just just this, uh, the examples you showed of um, of different forms of like of um, uh, different models for how how you can uh, approach approach ethics um, when you're working, uh, you know, across uh, both research and and artistic creation. And I was wondering. Um, at the beginning, you mentioned something where you said that there was both um i can't quite remember but it was both research-based arts projects and arts-based research projects and mm -hmm. i got i was i was curious about kind of and you said that created confusion and so i was curious about kind of um uh how how you know what is the difference between these two and what was kind of the positive outcome of this confusion um and also how perhaps um is there a difference in how ethics, how you would na navigate ethics if if it's one or the other, if that made sense. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so this term research creation has been around, um, I would say almost a couple of decades in Canada. And it's interesting that it was adopted both by the research, um, the federal research funding agency, SHRC, as well as uh, Canada Council for the Arts. So professional artists, you know, can get federal money in the research creation category and researchers can. Um, for artists, often it's considered um, research based art projects. So they need extra money to do um, a lot of research um, for their final outcome, which is an art project that they author. Um, for researchers, it's often creative activities um, that are used to um, uh, become, you know, answer a research question or become a research outcome. And then those are just two <laughs> scenarios out of many that both artists and researchers have come to find in between. Um, there's a really good article that was written. Um, oh, it's too early in the morning for me to recall kind of the era, but I think it would be, it's over 10 years ago and then it's been revisited a number of times in different uh, kind of projects by researchers. Um, but I could share it actually with um, Cassia and, and whoever is interested. And um, the writers sort of spell, uh, spell out four categories. Sometimes it's um, research with creation. Sometimes it's creation as research um, and a few more. Um, and that was, they just sort of threw this out. They were working with sound artists in an academic setting. So they noticed their grad students all had different kind of approaches, how much they felt they were researchers, how much they felt they were artists, how they were um, creatively coming up with, you know, innovative approaches. Um, anyway, in Canada, those four categories get repeated over and over again. It's sort of like we need, you know, hooks to hang our ideas on. Um, and people say, oh, in research creation, I'm from that category. <laughs> and uh, the writers have sort of regretted, you know, coming up with categories at all um, in retrospect. But um, 
Yeah, it's been very productive and it's still productive. I'm on a panel this uh, at the Cultural Studies Conference in um, June, where we are going to be talking about that again. And like cultural studies is another sort of discipline that's welcomed artists. So what are the artists actually doing there and what are the methods that they're coming up with and how many of them are really clinging to their, you know, solo authorship as artists over researchers, where does that work sit? Anyway, that's one of the ethical problems um, that that last toolkit kind of addresses. Um, when professional artists um, combine both a professional art career and an academic career, there are ethical um, and conduct issue questions that often aren't easily identified and maybe there's a culture around it, maybe there isn't, maybe it's a mess. Maybe there are, you know, very real legal issues. Um, and some art schools, you know, they've been doing it forever, so it's not a problem, but it's messy. Um, it, um, as far as property ownership goes, it, it is quite messy. And then when you add research participants or the artist gets research funding and then has participants, that can be messy. Um, I should also say, on that side of it, um, in Canada, artists' creative practice is exempt from ethics review in universities, so that's also a messy area, and that's exactly um, what the ethics board that I work with, we deal with that a lot. We're sitting, we say that we, we always sit in a grey zone, and so um, the ethics board often is in negotiations over whether or not um, the project needs ethics review. Um, or if it can be um, put out there as an art project. When that happens, the audience or the participants often understand that they're taking some risks, you know, um, risks for re-traumatization maybe, um, or the risk of the unknown, or the risk that their idea might be used by the artist. <laughs> All those risks you know, when we see the word art, we kind of know we're entering into an unknown, a few unknowns. Um, yeah, and then the risks or the ethics um, for um, researchers who use creative content, you've, your um, project uh, has already dealt with a lot of those, so you're, you've got um, discourse going on about that. Um, but I also want to enter this risk that, yeah, again, if the artist is a participant, there's risk to that person and their art as well, if it gets subsumed by academic research. Yeah, it's all, there's, there's, it's a rich territory. <laughs> Oh, I can't hear you, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, what I what I was saying was yes. It's it's really like you say. It's a really difficult terrain to navigate. And and so, but if I understand you correctly, it means that in Canada you have one funding institution where you can both get funding for for research that results in art projects or uh, <laughs> art and or research where you work with creative or artistic methods that then creates a research outcome is that correct in effect that happens there i i gave you two examples of very different funding agencies both from government funding mm -hmm. canada council for the arts is very specifically for artists federal funding for artists they have to you know it's a peer review very competitive so it's a very professionalizing organization um, they don't have ethics um, review boards, uh, or they don't expect them. Um, and then the other one is our uh, um, SHRC, um, Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council. That's also federal funding, but it's specific for academic researchers, so university-based researchers mm -hmm. too. They both use that term. Which okay. And they use it slightly differently. Um, and then <laughs> inside both of those agencies, people who are funded in either of those agencies, they use the term in a myriad of ways in both 
both scenarios. Mm. So we have time for one more question, I think, or one more comment. So this is your moment if you have anything you want to add. I think I, I was just wondering, but uh, because I see in the audience we have Liv, uh, who of course is uh, is an artist uh, working in the Norwegian context, and then Sarah, uh, uh, we also have you who kind of works across disciplines. Uh, Liv, I think also you want to work across disciplines a little bit more, and I'm 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 just thinking in in terms of in the context of the research, the kind of work that we're trying to do also with Inspire, I think. So, so one one thing would be how these issues also play out in other contexts. So, so in the Norwegian context, whether you would have some comments to what uh, Lois is saying, because I think that's an interesting discussion. Um, and then uh, for me, it's also a question of um, for our Inspire project itself, where we're working quite a lot with artists on this kind of collaborative uh, through collaborative work, but you know the ethical protocols, it's, they're not always that straightforward, right? We kind of have an uh, implied <laughs> um, uh, protocol, but um, mm, but to what extent do these things also need to be made visible, as you say, and, and very specific. So um, yes, I'll kind of throw this question to to you specifically. Was thinking about Liv and Sarah, but maybe there are others in the audience that I don't know who might also have something to say about this. Mm -hmm. Liv, do you want to say anything about that? Yes, I can comment a little bit. I think this was a very good uh, um, presentation from Louis Klassen, and uh, it's just like you said, it's a mess. Some uh, disciplines have clear ethical guidelines and some do not. Um, so as an artist, I tend to borrow from different disciplines mm -hmm. and um, see what I can use and what is useful. But if I overthink the ethics, I lose a bit of the artistic side because I need a bit of artistic freedom to be able to do my work. So it's a balancing act. Mm -hmm. But the more we learn about ethics and transparency, uh, the easier it is to apply it when and where it is needed. So I like these references that you presented, and I think uh, I may have good use of them in the future. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm glad it was helpful. Yes, Camilla. Hello. I think uh, you need to. Hi. Yeah, we hear you. Okay. I think um, my image is strange, but anyway, I'm on my phone. <laughs> Thank you for for an interesting conversation. Uh, I just wanted to add that I also work as an uh, artistic researcher uh, and um, have been working with ethics, not in, in the specific context that, that this is about, but, but ethics in artistic research more in general. Uh, I've been working myself with uh, uh, staging documentary material, which is also concerns um, traumatic material. And I think uh, what I think is important is uh, for the when the artist moves from from you know creating artwork outside academia and moving into research, there needs to be some kind of transparency, which in my uh, experience mm -hmm. has to do with that I have to as an artist start to look at my values and find a language for those uh, and communicate those to the people I collaborate with. So in a sense, I have to um, uh, find my ethics or, or you know, uh, articulate my eth ethics, which is a work that you don't really need to do when you're a free artist outside of academia. Uh, and of course, like, like Liv said, uh, with the arts, there is always a balance with artistic freedom, but I think you can always start to, to uh, interrogate your own you know, uh, values. Why do I choose this? Why do I like this? Why do I choose this aesthetics instead of that aesthetic? Why do I choose to work with this topic, etc.? So that would be my my answer without any specific guidance, which is always difficult for the arts uh, because arts is also it's also a space where you can 
sometimes cross what we would call ethical borders. Uh, and it's it's supposedly a kind of a safe space to do that. So I think that's an important function also that art can have as a critical uh, voice or, or a framework. But it still needs a transparency, I think. Thank you. Yeah, that's I really appreciate hearing that and I appreciate both of you defending the um, um, yeah, the safe space to experiment or um, be creative, make creative decisions, think creatively, take risks. Uh, we talk about that on at the ethics board in an art school all the time because that has huge value. So if an ethical, um, if, you know, someone is sitting with a tough ethical scenario, they need to look at what are the um, risks and to whom, what are the values, you know, where's the benefit of this work and artwork <laughs> has been shown to have huge value, you know, to society and that kind of careful reflection really increases the value and that is one of the benefits of doing it in an academic context where you're funded to think through um, these hard problems very carefully. So yeah, it's very important to defend that. Um, and as I said, you know, most audiences and participants, when they hear the word art, they will have some understanding of the risks involved. So being transparent, um, you know, understanding how to describe what you're doing in ways where you still preserve that opportunity for people to take risks or um, get involved creatively, you know, um, that's definitely something that you shouldn't give up. Thank you so much. We are out of time. I think we could have continued the discussion, but I will mm -hmm. end it here because uh, probably people have to go. Uh, thank you very much, Lois, for a very, very interesting presentation and a lot of food for thought. Um, I think the last thing I'd like to say is that the next seminar uh, will happen on uh, the 11th of May and we hope to do it hybrid. So for those of you who are in Oslo, you're very welcome to come to Prio. Um, and those of you who are not in Norway, you are welcome to join online. And we will be joined by Cecilia Salinas, who's an artist uh, based here in Oslo. Uh, so thank you very much and hopefully see you in May. <laughs>